Dr. Kaushal Bhanti is a FNRS postdoctoral researcher at the Louvain Institute of Biomolecular Science, Catholic University of Louvain, Louvain Le Neveu, Belgium. Prior to that, he was a postdoctoral researcher at the Copenhagen Plant Science Research, University of Copenhagen, Denmark, from 2016 to 2018. He is the recipient of the Charge de Recherche Fellowship and Grant by Fonds de la Recherche Scientifique Belgium, that is the fellowship and grant awarded to the researchers by the National Fund for Scientific Research Belgium. He received the Re Special Research Fund Moving Louvain 2019-2021 from the Université Catholique de Louvain Belgium Competitive Mobility Fellowship. He was selected as Plante Fellow and Network Leader, Plant Autophagy, American Society of Plant, like the uh, uh, American Society of Plant Biologist in 2019. He has many research publications in reputed international journals, like the Genetic Society of America, Frontiers in Plant Science, Journal of Integrative Plant Biology, Plant Physiology, Journal of Experimental Botany, Scientific Reports, Plant Gene, Plant Science, Journal of Biological Control, etc. He has published many book chapters. He actively participates in research presentations and workshops. We are very happy to have him with us today. I now request Dr. Bhanti to start his talk. Please, you can now share your screen. Thank you. Social, you yeah. start the skin scaring. Yes, it's coming. So. Can you see it? Yes. Okay. And this one, sorry. Let me reshare. Yeah, I hope uh, it is clear now, right? Yes. Full screen? Yeah, okay. Full screen. So good morning, everyone. It's uh, almost uh, eight here in Belgium. And uh, thank you very much, uh, Shubo and team, for uh, inviting me for this presentation. It's a wonderful initiative, I must say. And uh, especially quoting the uh, fact that you are providing information free of cost without a restriction to wide audience. It is just amazing. I mean, I really appreciate the concept. So I would uh, start my presentation. Uh, I usually show this slide very early about my roots, how I <laughs> developed myself from. So I came from a village uh, close to New Delhi, although in UP, and uh, where we involved in uh, farming and stuff, uh, especially wheat, rice, and other grains. And we love chapati, especially makka ki roti and saag. As you can see, my mother is cooking one. <laughs> so uh, close to my village, uh, actually at backside of my village, we have a train uh, track. So either way you walk, you reach the school. The other way you take train, you reach my college. And that's how we study a lot. We didn't have a lot of electricity at some point during my childhood, of course. Now we have everything. And then I moved to... Uh, not very known or famous college from bachelor and then following that I move uh, Banaras Hindu University for my master's in plant biotechnology and uh, before finishing master's I received a fellowship from uh, Department of Biotechnology Government of India for my PhD and then I joined uh, National Agri Food Biotechnology Institute in Mohali and uh, after my PhD I moved to Denmark, Copenhagen Plant Science Center, uh, to join Stephen Wenkel's lab. In Belgium, uh, for second postdoc, on uh, fund as uh, mentioned by uh, Soma, fund from FNRS, it's a fellowship and grant. And uh, today, project I was involved with uh, Stephen, and he kindly allowed me to talk about this, which is really wonderful of him. So uh, 
uh, it's the microprotein novel tools to bioengineer future ready plants and uh, as uh, you can see you can follow the exciting res result from stefan's lab by following uh, their twitter handle from mine i sometimes retweet a lot of good things and then uh, following uh, twitter handle of my current lab from uh, henry botokos labs so i i will keep it very simple uh, because i can see the diverse background of uh, listeners uh, ranging from undergraduate to scientists and i i i believe that a uh, lot of things here might be very really difficult to grasp for uh, undergraduates and they are really easy to grasp for scientists from molecular biology background and other things but i will try to make it more easy and uh, going to so that everyone can learn something uh, from this effort so i i, I will start with the uh, a very basic thing it's called uh, regulation of central dogma so everything starts from a fragment of uh, dna gene or you might call it loci if you are very classical the dna turns into rna by transcription rna to protein by translation and then the protein or group of protein they control a certain phenotype or trait or a function or a physiological aspect of a plant or any organism in living world and we know a lot about post translational regulation so post translation regulation is when rna is dna is turning into rna and rna is maturing at that point you can do regulation of rna quality or stability of rna it's called post translational regulation and then comes post translational transcriptional and then translational regulation so when protein is ready after translation there are certain aspects how protein quality should get control if if a organism really want that protein or not that decision also should come there after uh, transcriptional uh, processing and there are tools there are certain tools those have been in use since uh, start of molecular biology era to regulate aspect of dna quality mutation recombination and epigenetics for rna quality or or control of rna quantity too there are tools like micro rna small non coding rna alternative splicing rna processing ways however for protein quality regulation there are certain things but uh, there are not many tools those you can use to control post translational things how protein should express do you want to control it so everything comes before protein which you can use to control if protein should form or not but there are not many tools those actually target post translational regulation aspect of this dogma and now uh, there are new breeding tools breeding technology including crispr jrfn and other nucleases they are they are now collectively called the new breeding techniques and they cover dna rna part but again not the protein part so how how we want to control the trait we want to introduce into a certain organism is all set of these things dna level control rna level control and then protein level control so everything which has been highlighted here by red color mutation recombination mirna they all have been used as a tool to design certain aspect in living organism ranging from bacteria to higher plants or animals or even humans so i uh, as i have said that everything has been done very well at the level of dna rna but very few are there for protein and that's how that's why i should i want to talk to you about uh, microproteins which was work uh, i did during my stay in uh, steven wenkel's lab so let's uh, start with uh, what are microproteins now i mean the name says all uh, microproteins so they should be small of course microproteins they have only one protein protein interaction domain they regulate and bind to a bigger protein with multiple domains and then most of the known microprotein they are actually regulators of transcription factors it's not that they are only targeting transcription factor but till now whatever we have learned is the cases of transcription factors 
as you can see in the figure below this uh, this is a transcription typical transcription factor structure and uh, if you see that it forms a dimer and binds to DNA. If there is a microprotein highlighted by orange color, the microprotein will bind to a protein-protein interaction domain of transcription factor and inhibits its binding to DNA. And that's how they were framed as a, a controller of transcription factor or, or let's say negative controller of transcription factor. They sequester transcription factor into certain structures so that they don't bind their target DNA sequences. So how this breakthrough came, uh, it's interesting uh, way Stephen tells it. Uh, I mean, he coined the word microprotein after uh, his paper from uh, Stanford State. So uh, he identified a feed feedback regulatory module by little zipper proteins. These little zipper proteins, they target SDGIP3 transcription factor genes. So and I quote, uh, encode small leucine zipper containing little, little zipper proteins. They have domains. Those are found in Revoluta, Fabulosa, and Fabuluta protein. They are part of uh, a big SDGIP3 protein family. And when you overexpress little zippers, you see that function of HD3, SDGIP3 transcription factor is reduced. So how, uh, this zipper protein works during wild type situation, small zipper protein binds to irreversibly to transcription factor. If transcription factor forms dimer, it's a normal situation. It activates the normal growth and uh, flat leaf phenomena. When you have a loss of function for zipper, you have too much of SDGIP. And when these SDGIP proteins uh, form dimer, they cause upward leaf curl as you can see here but in other case if there are a lot of zipper proteins they voluntarily go ahead and bind to sdgip so that sdgip don't form dimer and you see downward curl leaf phenotype so that's how the that's how this phenomena of finding microproteins in plants start it's not that they were never reported they were reported as dominant negative before or as a small ORF proteins or uh, just uh, small proteins. But in this uh, paper, uh, review paper in uh, EMBO by Stephen, he coined the term microprotein and he introduced them very well, a group of protein that perturb formation of functional protein dimers. And again, I'm saying this uh, part of uh, science, microprotein is quite evolving in his hand. And uh, with time, uh, you see the concept is evolving, the understanding is building. And here he mentioned that protein dimers are forming. And then if you have a microprotein there, these protein dimers will not form. Instead, one of the monomer of transcription factor will bind with the microprotein and get sequestered. It will not function anymore. And because the result of actions are analog to microRNA, which are negative regulator of mRNA, that's why they call it microprotein. Small proteins, those are regulators of protein and causing the post-translational control. And I must say, microproteins, as I mentioned in my first slide, are part of uh, post-transcriptional control. Microproteins are part of post-translational control of protein. So how microprotein origin? There are two ways of defining microproteins. It's transmips and then cismips. So transmip is, is a case when uh, you have a small domain in uh, mRNA or part of mRNA that cause single ORF to form a MIP. So there is a huge domain, huge, uh, large mRNA available already. And then there is independent ORF, part of that mRNA or part of that protein that independently translated and cause uh, a translation into microprotein. It's called a transmib. However, complexity is even more for cismips. So cis is situation originated by three different events or it could be more in future, you never know. So alternative splicing, alternative translation start site, 
and uh, alternative polyadenylation. I, I will describe them in details here. So it's a full mRNA and then target. So part of this mRNA will undergo alternative splicing. The splicing will happen in a different way and then results into a smaller part of mRNA that codes for microprotein. So TSS here represent translation start site. What if case, if you have a translation and start somewhere between uh, mRNA structure, it will start from here and result into a microprotein. So, and then uh, translation also turn in turn at uh, polyadenylation site, which is signal that uh, protein structure should, uh, protein translation should stop here. So polyadenylation, Appearance of polyadenylation earlier than real polyadenylation site will result into a smaller ORF, and then finally a microprotein. And this all uh, has been very well described in uh, other reviews or maybe literature if you want to study or understand more how alternative splicing or translation and start site, stop site uh, works. However, in terms of uh, microprotein, this is how till date we describe them. So as I said, uh, the dimer formation by transcription factor and then inhibition of uh, this dimer formation by microprotein, it cause into sequestration of complex or sequestration of transcription factor into non-functional form. The typical example here is zipper, which I already explained. So a uh, monomer bind to microprotein results into non-functional sequestration, but there are not only sequestration cases, there are more ways how things work. There are repressor formation where uh, microprotein goes and bind to a protein where uh, the target protein is part of bigger complex. And when it is part of bigger complex, it means that uh, the microprotein will bind to target and this complex, which was functioning well before, will not function anymore in a way that it was working. So it's called repressor formation. Cytoplasmic retention, uh, if a transcription factor is getting processed, uh, coded in uh, cytoplasm, and it should uh, target into nucleus for function, microprotein can go and bind to transcription factor and stop it entering into the nucleus. And then ion channel, there are certain microproteins like VPU, those who binds uh, to proteins on transmembrane region to their transmembrane domain and then inhibit the ion channel functioning of uh, these proteins. So how we find microproteins, we understand till now how they work, how they code, how we define them. So our uh, colleague Daniel, he developed uh, a bioinformatics pipeline. It's this pipeline suggests a follow up how to identify microprotein from uh, any known genome or set of proteome. How we filter the information is uh, based on a certain characteristic, which we have defined before. Size of protein, microproteins are smaller than 140 amino acids. The sequence similarity to a bigger protein or a complex with multi-domain situation. The domain domain uh, structure with target and microprotein should be very compatible in terms of sequence and uh, amino acid composition. The protein domain that microprotein has should have a characteristic protein protein interaction feature. And till now there are 22 microprotein studied in Herbidopsis. Using this pipeline, which Daniel explained to MIFinder, he filtered microproteins from uh, different uh, genomes from ranging from bacteria and uh, then uh, animals, yeast as well as plant. And uh, he used these 22 known microproteins as a quality control if he is able to pull down these proteins using the pipeline he developed. So following this pipeline, he identified that conservation of microprotein is not only limited to plant, but it is more wider spread. For example, you can see here Arabidopsis and uh, mammals, Homo sapiens, GMH plant, and then other uh, life forms. And this is very complex. Yes, they are conserved based on uh, protein protein injection domain. They are conserved throughout uh, the 
the life forms. And it is surprising the, to learn in future if they also play conserve role. And that's actually, that actually will be really, really interesting to learn for plant biologists as well as the life scientists in general. So if you look at the transcription factor family, the homeo box domains are most conserved across uh, different life forms. Following uh, MYB transcription factor domains and then uh, BGIP in the end somewhere. So the, the overall message is uh, these microproteins are pretty conserved. They, they function in a way that could be conserved across life forms and subjected to further research. So how this uh, MIF finder helps, they identified uh, a new microprotein complex, MIF1A, MIF1B. And then finally, this study was published from Stephen Labs. So um, MIF1A, MIF1B forms a complex that regulate the flowering time in Arabidopsis by recruiting constant into a topless dimeric complex. So if you remember the introduction, I was saying uh, dimeric, dimeric, and suddenly it become trimeric complex. So that's how this area is evolving. And this is, how, this is why it is very interesting to learn how a new concept evolves with time. So what are MIB1A, MIB1B transcription vectors? So constant uh, regulator of uh, a transcription factor, which is regulator of uh, flowering time. It has uh, these BBB and CCT domain. However, constant uh, is not a single transcription factor. It has uh, multiple members in there. And MIB1A, MIB1A represent a partial domain from uh, this particular uh, transcription factor family. And that's how uh, the microprotein features looks like. So let's understand how it works. During uh, short days, short days inhibit uh, GIFK1, and then that finally controls uh, constant, which we were talking about. Constant forms a complex with BBX19. Whenever there is a MIP uh, AB constant topless, it inhibits flowering time. And whenever you express or overexpress MIB1A, MIB1B transcription factor in Arabidopsis, it results into suppression of flowering time, or let's say it delays the flowering. And that's how the first uh, MIB1A, MIB1B or multi-protein complex uh, involvement of microprotein was discovered. So they, these uh, microproteins, A and B,